All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I have a very interesting guest. Um, I actually saw him on Instagram and I was like, I got I to gotta get him on the show. So he is the four-time CrossFit Games adaptive wheelchair athlete. Yep, you got and, it. Absolutely. Uh, all right, awesome. And it's Tom Migazi. Did I say it right? Close, Miazga. Almost Miazga. got it. Yep. it. <laughs> I knew I was going to butcher it. I'm, I'm so sorry. But how's everything going? Things are going great, really well. I can't complain. Uh, you know, like you said, I just um, came off one of the games for the fourth year in a row in the, or mid-November. So just kind of took a little time, enjoyed Thanksgiving, and now just getting back into the swing of things and uh, see where we go from there. Yeah. So you you have a different is it a different form of cerebral palsy called uh, spastic uh, diplegia? Diplegia, correct. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's uh, well, if you think about cerebral palsy in a, in a general sense, it's a neurological disorder that at some point there is a misfiring within the, the brain stem down to the spinal cord where there's neurons that are all, you know, sending certain signals every which way. And it's, you know, there's some point in everybody's system that has CP where those messages just totally go awry. And it's a very generic way of stating it. I know because the vast array of how CP can affect someone is so great. Um, and I consider myself very, very lucky to be in the situation that I'm in. So for me specifically, my spastic diplegia, if you break it down is, um, spastic more meaning that my, I have in really a lot of a spasticity and that my lower half diplegia, lower half is that it's very tight all the time. So within my CP, I basically, if I tell myself to walk, I, I think the idea of walking and I think about how it would feel as I go and take a step. And then as I go to make that movement happen, my legs are incredibly tight. And so my muscles just basically tense up to an incredible state um, to the point where like when I walk, I don't bend my knees a lot. Uh, I have a very bow-legged stance. I have a very swinging gait. So a lot of my walking actually happens with my lower half uh, or my lower back, I should say. Um, and with that, you know, our natural lordosis and our curve, curvature of our spine, mine is very great because I'm always having to kind of press my hips forward to help me walk. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you can't see it, I look drunk. It's okay. I get it. That's sometimes the easiest way to put it. So um, I'm stumbling around here and there, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not that I can't walk. I certainly can. I use a chair most of the time though, though, cause it is, uh, you know, taxing on longer distances. It's a lot, it's a lot to get my feet for a long period of time. So the wheelchair has always been a lot easier for me in that realm. Um, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, stagnant. It hasn't really gotten any better, any worse since I had my last surgery. Gosh, back when I was in about third grade. So, um, I can tell when I don't use my legs more often than I do. So that was something to it. You know, there's a little bit of atrophy every once in a while, but I think that's all part of the natural process of being a human too. So, yeah. um, yeah, just taking care of myself, but yeah, life's good. And, um, it's, uh, it's been a blessing in many ways. So I'm excited to share about it more today. Yeah. So I, so little, little fact, I've actually was a personal trainer at one time and I was actually training somebody with cerebral palsy. Oh, cool. Okay. And, and so she was in high school, just about going into college. And, um, I think she had this, I'm not quite sure she had the same thing, but her knees would go in and yeah. walk. And so like, and she would like shuffle that way, but sure. like, obviously she would use a wheelchair when she's at school or whatnot, but when she went mm -hmm. to the gym, she came in here. And so like my main thing was she was weak on the left hand side. So I'd make her do like a lot of like single arm movements, you know, yeah, single totally. leg movements, like wall sits and put like a barrier between her legs to kind of work on the like insides and outsides of her legs doing wall. Right. Sits. So awesome. Very cool. Yeah. I, that sounds very similar. So like, obviously with the neurological side of it all as CP develops, you know, it has physical implications. Right. So obviously there's a lot of movements that, um, when you're a toddler in your infancy, like when your muscles are so tight like that, like for instance, my hips never like fully opened as a toddler because my hip flexors were so tight and I didn't have any really, you know, firing of my adductors or abductors for that matter, that like everything kind of just stayed closely knit. And so, yeah, I'm the same way. My knees kind of bow in a little bit word, uh, when I stand like upright, not when I walk as much, but, um, yeah. And so any sort of like squatting that I do, I have to put like a, a ball or a foam block in between these just to make sure I can get that really nice adductor firing and making sure that I'm getting this, you know, knees right over the toes and making sure I got that nice 90 degree at the front. Yeah. So I, I saw your video of you squatting 300, which was like super yeah. impressive. So. <laughs> Thanks man. Yeah. That was fun. So pretty much like, is that how you typically squat? So for the, for the listeners, 
Um, he was on the rig. His hands were on the bars in front of him, to the sides, and he the kind rig, of squatted yeah. down with like a horse. Um, what are they? A horseshoe bar? A yeah, bar? it's a safety. It's called a safety squat bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. made so, by Rogue. Yeah, yeah. So he actually squatted down with that with three hundred pounds on it, which was like super impressive. Like, <laughs> like wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I guess that's kind of a, that's a thing with CP too, is that it's not that the strength isn't there. It's more the coordination and the, and the mobility to do that kind of thing. Um, I remember before I even found CrossFit and in my former life as a competitive swimmer, I'd often go to our local, you know, 24 hour gold gym, similar gym. Right. And I'd use like uh, Smith machines for squatting. And I just like having that extra rebound and that little bit of like assistance to that was always like a great way for me to start. And I've always found with any sort of thing that I'm trying to achieve, whether it be some sort of squat or whether it was handstand walking and CrossFit, like it was always going to get better. It was just a matter of how patient I was willing to be with it. And so, um, I feel like for the most part, I have pretty good hip function. Like my hip flexors could probably kill somebody if you pull them out and, you know, try and beat someone with it. But, um, <laughs> beyond that, right. Like the, the, the knee flexibility is there. The ankle mobility is, is relatively there. So, um, squatting with the safety squat bar has always been a really nice way for me to incorporate just some daily living in my CrossFit life. Right. You know, as I compete in CrossFit, I'm doing most things from a seated position. So I'm not using my lower half that much. So for me, like I love CrossFit and love competing, but I found CrossFit for daily life purposes. And knowing that I'm 30 now, that even when I'm 40 or heck 50, I can still get on my feet and walk around or I can pick up my kids. No problem. You know, those kind of things. So, um, and that's when we got involved in squatting. So it was really nice to have that resource. I don't think every gym has that bar and they're actually about 70 pounds. So they're a bit heavier than a traditional barbell. Um, and for me, it really started even after before that was just doing basic air squats, um, holding onto the rig without any sort of weight on top. I had change plates underneath my ankles. I would do, um, you know, just down to a bench or I would go even to a really high box to start and just work my way slowly, slowly through it. Um, and that's when the Smith machine, or not the Smith, but the, uh, safety bar really just became a nice, like all the time thing. Like it just, I just got into a point where I felt comfortable. I was getting enough adductor and glute flexion to make sure that I could really stand that thing up again. And, uh, I, in training in our programming, we had a 10 rep max, I, like about a, six weeks ago and I hit 250, and I was like, that doesn't seem normal. I was like, that's pretty cool. And so we had the the bittersweet chance to go for a one rep, uh, last Monday. And so, yeah, like if I can hit 10 at 350 or 250, I can hit one at 300 and I hit 280 felt pretty good. I went down for 300 and I sat down for it and I started to come back up and I was like, okay, this is, this might be the max right now, but it was definitely really cool just to know like how sore I was the next day. I don't think most people would, you know, you think about a one rep and how taxing it can be. But for me, I was like, really pumped to know that I was really hitting those mar muscles and targeting that so well. I know, um, so some people ask me like, how much were you really using your arms? And it was like, it looks like I'm tense. Like, and I am, cause I'm gripping for dear life, not to help pull myself up, but more just to make sure I don't fall backwards. Right. Yeah, I'm just exactly. making sure I'm staying upright. And as though, you know, as grounded as I was on my heels, like there's no reason my hips couldn't just pop forward and I lose that bar behind me. So, um, that was more just to stay stable and just feeling that the firing that I did the next day through my glutes and my hamstrings and everything. I was like, that's awesome to know that like, I've been able to come that far and, and be able to succeed like that. So that was a big win. Yeah. yeah cool. So have you ever heard of velocity based training? A little bit. I'm not too familiar, but I've, I've, I think I've understood the guidelines of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so pretty, so pretty much like if you're setting up for a one rep max, if it's either like, dead, like mainly like it's for back squatting, so you add like 15 to 20 more pounds onto the bar and then like hold it for like 30 seconds and then go yeah. back and then just lighten the load. And then it's supposedly like really easy to, to get it up. Oh, nice. Awesome. That's cool. And that's definitely interesting too. Cause even when I hit 280 before that, I could tell my CNS was starting to get a little hot yeah. and bothered. And that's always been an issue too with the CP. So like when I was a swimmer, it was always about, you know, overdoing it too much or being in cold water for too long where my muscles in my lower half would really start to panic and spasm. So I'd have clonus all, I still do have clonus a lot. Um, it's been really nice since getting in across it. It was really aggressive at first because my body was just not used to the adjustment, but then I started to find a training program that was a lot better adept for me. And it's just like, you know, not doing a high volume of work every single day and just making sure that it's like high intensity, but you know, a lower volume, like that's where I really started to click in and really feel like this is what's going to be best for me. And so 
even going to that uncharted territory of squatting with that much weight. Like I put 280 in my back and got through it just fine. And even standing up 300 for the first time to get ready, I was like, my legs were shaking. I was getting a little nervous. Like, I don't even know if this is a good idea because if I, <laughs> my legs decide to bow out on me here, we had a lot more issues than just trying to stand up. So, um, but no, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Like, that's definitely good for me, especially to get that CNS like primed for such yeah. weight and know that it's like, a familiar territory rather than going to a blind and think like, let's just <laughs> close our eyes and hope we stand up again. <laughs> so, so you were talking about swimming before yeah. this. So you have quite the career in swimming. And I do. Thank you. Yeah. I, I've, I've actually, I actually did try to do some research on you. So you have, um, you've collected 13 medals during your swimming career and you've set eight American records. In the yeah. Swim. So um, how, how did, how did swimming get involved? Like growing up? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a pretty cool story. Actually, I was, um, I'm the youngest of four kids in my family. And so all three of my siblings ahead of me had my second grade teacher named Steve and Steve, uh, was the local swim coach in the area. He was coaching the high school team at the time. He was working for a local club in the neighboring town. Uh, and by the time I got to second grade, he had started his own club in our city. Okay. And so he knew of me well before I knew him because he had all my siblings and they had all told him about me and all this stuff. And, um, I had never really found a sport at that point yet where I felt like I was, you know, able to fit in really well. And I really enjoyed playing baseball. You know, my brother played baseball. So I always kind of followed what he would do and he would, we'd go golfing a ton, but again, that was always a physical demand on me that I, more than I could usually handle. And, obviously soccer wasn't up my alley and I couldn't run long enough to do basketball. So it's just kind of always trying to, you know, felt like a, just kind of a no man for a little while, just trying to figure out what I want. And the water was always one place where I felt like my disability was a bit eradicated where, you know, you asked me to stand on one foot in gym class for, you know, and I can do it for about two seconds. And then you get me in the water, I can stand on one foot for two days, you know, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like almost this superpower feeling that it had, because I knew that like, having a wheelchair growing up, I always had a, a bigger upper body and I was more built up top. And I knew that like, even when my legs were a non-factor in the water, I could pull myself through the water pretty well. Um, and I never really knew swimming as a competitive thing. I knew it as hanging out with my friends, going on vacations in the ocean, going to lakes. I never knew that like swimming back and forth for a time was a real thing. And so, uh, Steve introduced me to his club when I was in his class and, um, it was basically a love story right out at the beginning. So it was just one of those things where it took a lot to get used to, but I also could already tell that like I was going to catch on quicker than most, you know, and it was, it was just one of those feelings where my disability was finally something that I didn't have to worry about. And mm -hmm. I think that all mindset alone allowed me to push myself so much harder, so quick, much, so much quicker. Um, and so I ended up swimming from like second to fifth grade and, uh, C was my coach. We built this fantastic relationship and it was incredible. And then I had my last surgery, uh, which gave me a, a little bit more hip mobility. We went in and they hand lengthened like my Achilles, my calves, my quads, uh, and actually got me up on my feet enough that I could actually play baseball. And so that was always kind of the true thing and the true passion. And so I played baseball through middle school and then it was back in high school. I was a freshman. I was on our student council and I was helping set up for our homecoming dance, I think in the gym on a Saturday morning. And I'm wheeling around and, you know, uh, context. I hadn't seen Steve at this point since I left the elementary school in fifth grade. And so, you know, he and I were buddy, buddy, super great friends. And all of a sudden I'm just like, gotta go. Bye. I just totally left everything. And, uh, I'm wheeling around the school that morning, setting up for homecoming. And I wheel past the pool and I just, you know, casual look into the pool and look through the glass doors. And sure enough, there's Steve. And we make this awkward eye contact of like, uh, you left three years ago without much of an explanation. And I don't know why. And so I was like, <laughs> I feel like I kind of need to go talk to you real quick. And so I went in there and we, you know, we talked away for a good hour and a half. And I remember leaving the pool being like, I think I'm back on the swim team. All right. Awesome. And so I went home, told my parents I was interested in swimming for the high school team. That's at uh, first freshman year and ended up uh, getting right back to where I was. It was pretty cool. Um, the cool story about all of it is that one night uh, Steve was at home watching Remember the Titans. And there's a point in the movie where the star linebacker, spoiler alert here, gets uh, T-boned in the car accident and he gets paralyzed waist down. Well, the team goes, they win the championship and they come visit his buddies, come visit him in his hospital hospital room. And he's you know, like, Oh, how you doing? Like, how you feeling and stuff? He's like, yeah, you know, 
my legs don't work anymore. I'm paralyzed waist down, but I already found out there's sports for people in wheelchairs. And Steve's literally watching this thinking like, is this a real thing? And goes and Googles it and sure enough, finds the Paralympic organization. So the next day he brings in this whole stack of papers, you know, it's like a dictionary size stack of papers about everything in Paralympics and how there's different classifications. And you'd swim against people that have CP like you, and you can go to all these different level meets. And it was one of those things where what it's always stood out so much about this is that no one ever asked Steve to do this. Right. And nobody ever asked him to reach out to the guy in the wheelchair and find a connection and make him feel like he's somebody. It was just something that he always did because he wanted to and knew that there was potential that I hadn't found in myself yet. Um, and that's why we've always bonded for so long and that he was so incredible in such an incredible figure in my life is that he just saw so much more in myself that I could ever see. Right. And um, he told me that day when he was talking about the Paralympics, He's like, I've been to every single level of swimming up to the Olympic games at this point. And if anybody's going to get me there, it's going to be you. And I'm like, I'm crying. Like, Oh, that's so nice of you. And I'm like, sir, yes, sir. At the same time, like, let's go, you know, I'm all fired up. <laughs> and uh, not two months later, we go to our first uh, national meet. I get myself classified and um, swimming. My race is pretty well ended up doing successfully, pretty successfully. And uh, not three months later, I'm down in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, swimming at the Pan Am Games and won six medals in seven events. I was like, all right, I think we found something here. So uh, it just kind of took off from there. It was my junior into senior year summer of high school. So 17 when I ended up qualifying for the Beijing Games in 2008. And so I'm the hunter back and 400 meter freestyle over there and uh, got to complete the mission, you know, got to get Steve to the games and it was awesome. He made out the trip all the way over to Beijing with my family and got to watch there. And it was uh, pretty incredible. So I uh, ended up swimming all the way until 2015 when I formally hung it up. Um, long story short, if we had a whole other day to talk, I swimming has been great, but also one of the biggest blessings was my, I guess my biggest failure in that in 2012, um, I'm a junior in college. I'm at St. Louis university. I'm swimming for their D one team and feeling like I'm bigger, faster, stronger, better than ever. And I really was like in the world rankings, I was showing that I was improving. Uh, and we were both thinking at that point, like, let's get ourselves on the podium and in podium in Beijing. Um, and it's like, you know, you're primed in this hundred backstroke to, to make a move and, um, how people qualify for the, the Paralympic team are very different than the Olympic team and the Olympic side of things. If you're top two in your event, you basically qualify to go. And in the Paralympic swimming world, there are 14 different classifications of disabilities that all kind of swim relative to each other. Um, and so if you do that with every single event for every single class, you're basically taking everybody that shows up to the meet to the games. So it's not very fair. Yeah. Um, and so everything is based off of world rankings. And so basically whatever your fastest time is when you get to that meet, um, they re-enter you into the, in the world rankings based on that time and um, hope you're high enough, right? So in 2020, uh, sorry, 2008, we got to take 20 guys to Beijing, but in 2012, we only got to take, um, 13, I believe, or 12, 12. Um, so it was the number had dwindled quite a bit. We lost a lot of guys to retirement that didn't really, that we hadn't really filled the void. Um, and then we just didn't have as successful of a world championships the year prior to help get more slots. Um, nine guys had qualified automatically to the team for being top three in the world at trials. And then, um, Two guys after that were fourth in the world. So they automatically qualified next. And so then for the 12th spot, I had finished, I think I believe it was sixth in the world in the 100 back. Like I won my event at trials and everything. Would have made top eight easily at the games or, you know, been in a good spot to have at least made it. Um, but myself and another individual were both tied for sixth in the world in our relative events. And then at that point, if there's a tiebreaker, it goes to how far off the third place time in your event you are percent wise. And had I been one one hundredth of a second faster, I wouldn't have been sitting at home in August and letting him go to the meet and I would have been gone instead. So my whole world totally flips in one one hundredth of a second. When people say life can't change on a dime, I'm like, I, I can prove you wrong because I had left St. Louis, St. Louis University, took a leave of absence to come home and trade with Steve. Um, I was in the physical therapy program where my whole schedule is basically set for me. And I was at a point where I couldn't take the classes I needed to move on to until that next spring when I had prior left. I left in the fall of 2011. 
And I'm like, okay, yeah, get through 2012. Like you got to miss so much of the semester in the fall anyway, because of the games. And then you'll go back in the spring of 2013 and pick up where you left off. Like no big deal. Well, I didn't make it. I didn't have a job. I couldn't go back to SLU or I'd lose my financial tuition or my financial aid by breaking my leave of absence code of conduct. Um, and so I was literally left with nothing. And so I ended up actually transferring to Marquette up here in Milwaukee, where I'm from, and uh, got my elementary ed degree because Steve had actually helped me get a coaching job and the swim side of things. And quite honestly, I didn't really want to swim at that point. So I'm like, let's see if I can find something else about swimming to help me get engaged. And I instantly fell in love with coaching and I knew like, this is what I want to be doing. This is where I want to be the rest of my life. And so I built a life around that. So I went to Marquette to get to my elementary ed degree. Um, it reignited me enough to get back in the water. And I swam until 2015 when I finished my education degree. Um, and I was all set on going to 2016 and trying to make it back to Rio and have this big redemption song. Um, but I ended up hanging it up at my national meet because I was going into my student teaching semester uh, and I was, as soon as that was done, it would be then the fall of 2016. And I'm all, I'm like, into my head, I'm like, who's going to hire a first year teacher. Who's got to miss the first month of the school year to go to the, you know, the Paralympic <laughs> games. It was kind of a dilemma there where the pragmatics ended up taking over. And I never thought I'd see the day where I'd be so comfortable to stop swimming and like, just stop training 12 times a week and go into the weight room and just literally mutilating my body sometimes just in the water. And I just so quick hang it up, hung it up. Like it was nothing. And it was, uh, it was a very content moment that I'd never thought I'd experience as I did. And, um, ever since then though, it's been fantastic. And that was actually, well, I mean, the CrossFit then was because I left the swimming world. I got my first teaching job and I got involved in the classroom. And even a few months in, I was just already thinking like, okay, wow, I'm not going to be able to be in my chair as much as I thought. Like I need to be on my feet a lot more. And swimming was a blessing for my hips, right. And my mobility and my core stability, it was great. And when I hadn't swam for a couple months at that point already, I could already tell like, okay, we're starting to change here. There's some atrophy mm -hmm. going on. Like we need to make sure we keep this up. And that's when I found some buddies that had told me about our local CrossFit gym. And I knew nothing more than watching YouTube fail videos and thinking like, this is it's stupid. Like, why would I go do this? Right. And, um, but I gave it a chance and, you know, I went in and we were really fortunate that our, our, our first location of our gym, we were conjoined with a chiropractic and muscle movement therapy system, uh, physical therapy team. And I went with them first and kind of just talked about what I was looking for, what I'm trying to do in the gym. And they set me up with a trainer who helped me just through basic movements. Like I was talking about earlier, like those, those toddler developments that I never, my CNS never really let me have, like we played with those. Like I did, I did squats on my knees, just working on sitting from my heels to sitting, sitting upright, you know, and on my knees or, um, working on glute bridges or just wall sits and basic things like that, just keep my hips going. And we made some big progress really quickly, like more than I ever thought I would have with swimming. Um, so it was pretty cool. And then, and someone said the blessed idea of, uh, Hey, why don't we add some pull-ups to this? And I'm like, now we're talking like, this is my jam. <laughs> like you, you, me and pull-ups go way back. So, um, very quickly, I just jumped into my first couple classes with the CrossFit gym and the rest was history. It was like 26, late 2016 that I did that. I went into the 2017 open, like totally blind, never had any idea of like competing about like what this meant or what it was doing. And, um, shockingly won the adaptive open in 2017, like, ah, oh, all right. And, uh, I was like, so kind of taken aback by that, that actually didn't go to the games. I like, wasn't ready. I was like, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for this. Like, I, I understand my place in this, but like, I just figured out the difference between a power snatch and a, and a squat snatch, like last week, like I got to slow down. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, from there on out, I kind of just have been falling in love with it. Cause I, I get to train the same way that I do with swimming where I'm able to push my body beyond limits that I thought existed. And I'm able to learn new things and try new things and, uh, just be a part of a community where there's no judgment about who you are, or who you're coming in as and what you're trying to achieve. You know, everybody's there for the same umbrella of health, which is fantastic, you know? And, um, it's just one of those things where I've always seen sore soreness as a gratification as like, a you did good yesterday. Like you made improvements here. If you don't change, you're not getting better. If you're not getting outside of your comfort zone, if you're not getting this, 
you know, ex feeling discomfort, like your body's never going to learn how to adjust to any other stimulus than what, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's just been so cool to learn through that. And, um, as much as I love the competitive side, still, like I said, it's just been so fun to be so immersed in the CrossFit world as an L1 now at our gym and being in the adaptive world and just kind of experiencing it for all it's worth. And just knowing that like you can feel health when it's right, you know? And I remember even the first couple of months of like, this is what healthy feels like. You know, I felt like I could do anything for a long time. And I just felt like I was just continually getting better and better. And it was even, I was telling a few members a couple of weeks ago that I was like, when I first started CrossFit, I never even thought I could lift a laundry basket up the stairs, you know, while holding the laundry basket and walk up the stairs at the same time. And now I think I did it. A, I told them like, I did it a couple of weeks ago without even thinking about it. Like it was like one of those crazy things where it's like, I'm not specifically training for that, but I know that what I'm doing through the gym and the different modalities that I'm practicing on a daily basis are leading me to that. And that's just helping my daily life, which man, if everybody could just like drink that Kool-Aid for a little bit, like give us a chance, like you'll be so amazed. <laughs> so yeah. Well, very cool. Yeah. So that's, that's what I actually, one of, one of the workouts I used to do with my, my, uh, my, you know, client. So she was, she applied to this movie theater job. And so she'd have to lift oh. like 30 pounds in like, of like probably a trash bag or something like that. And like, throw yeah. it right. so I would get a med ball and like have her walk from one side of the room to the next. Oh, nice. Yeah. And just to, just to get a gist of like what it is. And like, it would go to like eight pounds and we went up to 20 and she did pretty yeah. good. But like when we got to 30, that was like a whole, like she just fell right down or like fell down pretty much. And okay. yeah. And so uh, she, she understands and like, and like a lot of people get nervous with her when they, when she falls down, but she's like, no, I'm okay. It, it oh, happens. Yeah. So yeah. 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 It, like the first time when she fell, I almost, I was like, just, I freaked out. I was just like, are you, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> like we would go on like the Smith, the Smith machines pretty much. And oh, yeah. she's like deathly afraid of like the free weight room and the, the Smith machine room. She would just go, her um, previous trainer would just stretch her out and that's it like no, mm -hmm. no, like lifting or anything like that. And so she yeah. got nervous. So she thought she actually did a, an amazing job. And then she's, I'm like, yeah, you made these machines, your bitch. And she's like, yeah, they're my bitch. And then she just hit the corner and she tripped up on like one of the sides of the machine <laughs> and, fell, yeah. and like, it, it fell down. And I'm like, well, I guess the machines are still your bitch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Karma's <laughs> still a real thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah karma's exactly. the bitch. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like it was, it's, it was interesting. Cause she's, she was my first like, you know, client that had a disability like that. Yeah. You know, I've had like diabetics, I've had like overweight people, but I've never had like somebody with CP and, yeah. you know, just learning about like what she can do, you know, the weights and like what she wants to do in other ways of like training her compared to like other personal trainers. It was, it was, it was awesome. And just seeing yeah. her grow and like lifting more weights than she ever thought she could. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And I think that's often a lot of the issues that I think a lot of disabled individuals have about really expressing themselves and what they're capable of, because I think, unfortunately, society still looks at anybody with a disability as like they need help. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, we have to help them all the time when in reality, it's like everything I do, I always go with the mindset of like, what happens if I have to do this alone? Like, what am I going to do if nobody's around to help me? Like, how am I going to figure this out? And it's now I'm stubborn to a fault because like, that's how I live my whole entire life. And I don't ever let anybody help me. Um, but yeah, I totally get that where it's like, if you take the time to understand what somebody's trying to achieve, you know, with a disability, like there's obviously going to be hindrances and there's going to be fears, but there's also going to be goals and there's going to be opportunities and there's going to be a level of commitment and dedication that you will have never experienced because you know, not to pity or play the fiddle like here, but like, there's a lot of things about life that are a lot harder that most people don't have, like ever even have to think about, you know, like going upstairs is still a chore. Like it's still something I got to watch my feet and make sure I don't trip myself up. And I'm seeing people run up all past me, you know, like no big deal. So yeah, there are things that slow us down, but I think if you're taking the time to have a communication with somebody with a disability and you're willing to learn about what they're trying to achieve, what they're afraid of, what they're willing to work for, that makes the whole conversation so much easier. And then that's when the progress really starts to happen. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, do you, do you follow, do you follow like the local gym pro gyms program or do you have like another company that actually does your, your programming? Yeah. So I've kind of, uh, when I first started initially, I was just doing what our gym was doing. Um, and then my trainers that I was working with specifically would help kind of adapt and modify workouts as needed. 
Um, as I got more into it, I followed a more satellite universal program called CompTrain, um, which was really great. I loved it. I think I got to a point where I was like, okay, I can be really serious about this now and I can really start to elevate my game. Um, I was with them for quite a while. They were a great program, but that's when I really started to realize that they were too much volume for what I was trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things too, where I felt guilty if I wouldn't do all of it, but I also knew that doing all of it was not good for me. Yeah. And so it was, it was a hard burden that I tried to, you know, try and balance once in a while. Um, and so then I started working after I went to my first games appearance in 2018. Um, one of my fellow competitors now turned like our um, head judge and kind of spearheads a lot of our wheel wide events, Kevin Ogar. Um, he's been training me uh, through his programming for the last couple of years. Uh, it was really great. Like I said, it was earlier, it was it's a much less volume, but higher intensity, more strength focus. Cause that's always been one area I'd like to increase. Like swimming is giving me that cardiovascular background and that endurance background. Right. So, um, it's more of the strength piece that we're trying to, we tried to build on and stuff. And so that was really great. Um, and I worked really well with Kevin, him and I got along really well. Um, and we've just recently had a couple of buddies from the gym now that are looking to get more serious and try and make it onto a more games level athlete stance. And, um, so we've been training together for a few months now following a, a program called training think tank. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've been really cool in that, like, they don't try and do all the glitzy and glamoury stuff and make things really special and unique. Like it's just like raw work of like, this is a five minute AMRAP go as hard as you can for five minutes on these simple, basic movements. And I really appreciate that because one, it's easy for me to adapt to what I need to do, but most of the time I can do it straight up. And that's been really nice and really rewarding that regard. So um, I still follow Kevin's strength programming. I still use him for a lot of those resources, but it's just really nice to have somebody in the gym to like train with and train next to. I think this kind of was kind of eating at me in the last year or so, uh, especially during COVID time was just training my own programming by myself. Like I know it was very streamlined for me and that was great. Uh, it just got hard to just do it all by myself all the time. So it's been nice to have some teammates and push each other in that regard. So yeah, it's been, it's been a good ride. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Training alone is, is hard. I've been doing it for like four years. Oh yeah. Dude, it's, it's a burden. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you want to push yourself and I try to like go as hard as I can, but then it's just like, okay, like I'm going to take a step back from the bar and take like a longer break. And then I'm like, yeah, don't be an idiot. Just, just, just go. (laughs) I know it's always one of those things too. And you know, we've, uh, unfortunately lost a lot of in-person competitions with COVID and everything like that. So a lot Mm -hmm. of what we've done in the last 18 months, up until prior to the games this past month has been virtual, right? And everything's at home at your own gyms, you're submitting videos and submitting scores. And even then, like, yeah, you have a little bit more adrenaline, but you don't have quite that adrenaline that you get when you're live and somebody that you're trying to beat is right next to you and you can hear them. And it was amazing. Like what an eye opening experience it was like to think like, I can go this much harder. Like I didn't realize that like at the games last month, like I didn't think, I would be able to move as fast and as well as I did, just knowing that like I hadn't been able to reach that potential by myself for so long, you know, in training by myself. So yeah, yeah. it's, I definitely understand that struggle. Now, when you typically train, do you have like someone with you to help out with like setup or anything like that? Or is it just like all you? Um, not on a training daily basis. No. So, um, my good buddy who I'd equate to like the Steve of CrossFit, his name's Jason. So when I first joined CrossFit, Jason was the guy that really helped kind of get me involved in this wheel a lot thing. We've been doing this journey together. Um, and so Jason is the head coach and owner of the gym that I also train and coach at, at Adapt and Conquer CrossFit. And um, so he's around, like we work out a lot together, but I have a, I have a detachable fifth wheel on my wheelchair that actually provides for stability and balance. So anytime I'm doing any sort of lifting um, anything pressing overhead wall balls, something like that, where I kind of lean back into my chair. I use that fifth wheel, um, and anchor that in. And that's so stable and so strong that I'm not having to need anybody to hold on to me. Jason will hold me when we go to competition. So if I'm on the competition floor, like he'll anchor me in and make sure I don't move an inch more for efficiency and, and fluidity purposes. Right. And just being faster and competitive, but when I'm training on my own, like, it's just nice to have that, like, it's all fun. It's all to me and on my core and making sure I'm working well. There are things once in a while Jason may hold me for, but uh, no, for the most part, I'm on my own. I'll set up all my own equipment. Um, I'll sometimes just modify or, or adapt movements as I need to based on what I feel like I need at the current time or, you know, relative to what I did yesterday and making sure I'm doing something different. But uh, oh, yeah, it's just usually me and, and our buddies just working out. I think that's kind of the nice thing too, is that um, there's comfort in knowing that like 
nobody coddles me in the gym that way. It's like, oh yeah. my God, do you need me, do you need me to get you your wall balls? Do you need me to get you your barbell? It's like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, and I'll and then I'll and then I'll turn around and be like, hey, can you grab me a wall ball? I'm like, no, get it yourself. I'm like, all right, fair enough. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. So obviously you, you've won the games four times. Yeah. And so when I know you talked about 17, you actually won the won the open. So when did you yeah. want to like turn the page and say like, okay, let, let's, let's do something about this and actually make it to the games. Yeah. Um, it would have been what would have been day one of the CrossFit games in 2017 when I didn't go. Cause I regretted it like instantly. I was like, ah, oh, like I could have done this. I should have been ready for this. And so, yeah, that moment right at then on was like one of the eye opening moments of like, there's potential here and we can do this and like, let's go for it. So, um, and then in 20, it was 2018 that I went to Wadapalooza for the first time, which is a competition down in Miami, yeah. um, in January. And that was awesome. I had a blast there. Um, it was so cool to see the spectacle that they put on for adaptive athletes and just make them a main stage, you know, event throughout the entire weekend, which, you know, to that point was not always around in, in the, CrossFit side for adaptive athletes, you know, we lot, the program that basically runs all adaptive athletics has been, or CrossFit has been doing phenomenally with that, but, um, it's not really, you know, until recently you're seeing CrossFit embody the adaptive side of life into the brand more. Um, so I went there and then from then on, it was like, um, I kind of, so I had a pretty wonky schedule. I was actually still teaching. Um, I'm actually no longer teaching now. So I was still teaching the first year that we opened up a new site of our swim club that I now run. And ironically, it's with Steve. So Steve and I now run the swim club that I was a part of all my life and stuff. So back in 2018 was that same year. So it was my last year of teaching. And we also started this new site of our club in the district I was at. And all of a sudden I found myself with two full-time jobs. I was still trying to train to be this big, you know, competitive athlete. And I was, um, you know, just running myself so thin, like to the point where I was actually working out, doing these two and a half hour comp train workouts at like 8 30 at night if I was lucky more like mm -hmm. 9 9 30 and I'm being up again at 4 a.m the next day and oftentimes I was so worn out or so like unmotivated to train that I had to find something to get me like excited about it and I was the only one obviously at the gym at the time I was out there by my own in the dark and so I made it a secret project of learning how to do handstand push-ups and I was like you know what like people are not going to expect this when you're in a wheelchair like they're going to be like and even myself, I was like, there's no reason I should be walking on my hands. Like that does not make any sense. That's completely contradictory to what a wheelchair athlete would look like. <laughs> and, uh, and it started so simple of just like literally just pivoting onto my head and just doing a headstand with my hands, you know, just on the wall and like getting used to that upside down feeling, feeling the activation of this, of the press and making sure you're like understanding where your muscles are going to go. How's your core going to react? Whatever are my feet doing above my head? Right. Um, and slowly that worked into like handstand descents where you're just eccentric descents and just like really slowly and controlling yourself down, really feeling that good activation. And then it turned into handstand pushups. And then all of a sudden it turned into handstand walking. And it was just kind of like, okay, this is pretty cool. So I remember I posted a video of me doing it, um, on my Instagram and in, like early 20, like, I'm like probably like a month or two after Wadapalooza. And it totally blew up. Like CrossFit reposted it. Yep. I like CBS Sports reposted it. Like everyone's just like, oh, look at the strength, this guy. And so that's when it really started to realize that like I don't need to be confounded by what I think an athlete needs to be, right? Or what it should look like. And so I trained myself as if I was, you know, a games athlete. I would work really heavy cleans for my chair and I would work with, you know, big weights as much as possible. And I'd put for myself to do things that didn't seem normal. Like I'd wear weight vests for everything. I was doing all my pull-ups out of my chair and, you know, working on bar muscle-ups and ring muscle-ups and all these different movements that like, I knew I had the strength for it was just a matter of learning how to function appropriately and adapt them and getting this, the, the kinesthetic of it all in my body to like work together. And so, um, as long as you, I've gone in with like a, a never say die attitude, like it's always, it's always paid off. And, and so, like I said, some things have taken a little bit longer and taken more patience to figure out, but no, I'm at a point right now where I feel like I have every, every single tool I need in my toolkit for CrossFit to be successful, which has just been so cool. And so it's been really fun in that regard 
to see that pay off on the competitive side, but also just help kind of be a, a, a guidance in like, here's what you can do as a seated athlete, you know, mm-hmm. and here's how, here's how you can adapt workouts and adapt movements. And I know I fall into the trap of, you know, looking good for society and only posting the fun things on Instagram that not the daily life stuff. Right. And it's even then I still try and post some stuff where it, you know, like, here's as easy as getting in and out of the chair. Like here's as easy as like, yes, you don't have to be disabled or paralyzed to still use a wheelchair. And like my legs still can function and I can go upstairs and all those different little things have been really cool. And just the amount of people that have reached out asking questions about how to make things work or, you know, the ones that really get me are the the parents like, Oh my God, my seven-year-old son is CP. And I showed him your video and he's just so motivated. And I'm like, that's the stuff that I love. Not because like they're, they're trying to be a games athlete, but like they're seeing somebody that has shown that like it's possible, you know, and to be that person for somebody is like, it's so surreal because that was Steve for me, right. Growing up, he was that person that showed me that I could achieve more than I thought. And to, be in that other side of it now and have this chance to show reciprocity and give back what was given to me. Like that's how I live my whole life. Right. It's just like, I have been blessed with an incredible support system and people in my life that have shown me that my disability doesn't need to hinder me from what achieving what I want to achieve, you know, and it's just so cool now to be a full-time swim coach and a full-time CrossFit coach. Um, and just giving that opportunity back in the same way that it was given to me. And it's, it's been awesome. It's been incredible. And I, I'm just so humbled. Like every time I think about this and have conversations like this, it's like, I have to pinch myself. Cause I'm like, like, it's so easy to get lost in the daily hustle of it all that it's like, look how cool your job is, you know, like, look at it, that you get to do what you want to do and enjoy it and make a living off of it. And, you know, like, you know, cheers to you. Right. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, That's pretty much like why I started type one lifting. Like I told before, like, you know, do you have some diabetics that, you know, or, or anybody with a disability, you know, they're all like, woe is me. You know, I'm like, yeah. kinda, you know, handicapped with this like certain disease. And it's like, no, I mean, there's, you can still do amazing things with a disability or a disease. Just like look at right. all these people and exhibit, exhibit a, like your, your, your ring muscle ups are probably better than mine. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, and, and like, it's, it's impressive that what you're doing I and mean, it's awesome. And it's, it's, and it's also like pretty cool that you're getting, you know, people on your DMs being like, Hey, you know, this is awesome what you're doing. Cause I, I get like, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but it's just like, no, I get, please do. Yeah. I get the same thing too. Like I get, yeah. parents, I get parents like, Oh, you know, you know, my son's a diabetic or my daughter's a diabetic, you know, yeah. and I just show you your, your videos or just like your podcast or whatnot. And like, and, you know, just, you know, say, Hey, you can do these amazing things. Just, you know, oh, absolutely put your heart into it and then like, just try it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But then like, at least you tried it instead of just like, be like, Oh, you know, I, I, I can't do that. And just, right. Right. And that's, yeah, I think that's, it's just so cool to have that perspective and have that opportunity. And, uh, at the same time, it's very different. You know, I was forced to grow up really young. Right. I was forced to be mature and have to look at life a lot differently. And, you know, like just having to go through surgeries as a young kid and not be able to do all the things that my friends are doing at recess. Like it was different. And it just asked me to look at life in a different lens and say, what really is success? You know, is it plaques? Is it medals? Is it trophies? Is it beating other people? Like, no, it's just about learning about what your abilities are right now and learning how to progress them to something that's better than they were before. And I told my kids, I was a sixth grade math teacher. And so I told them all the time with fractions or decimals or things they didn't like doing. I'm like, there are multiple ways to do this and still get the right answer. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how you go with that approach. As long as you're giving yourself to that approach and learning what you're learning about or taking that to heart and saying like, this is what works best for me. Like I'm better when I do it this way. And we got the same answer, even though you do it a different way. And that's how it is with life. I had to take an elevator. Sorry. I'll meet you up there when I get up there. I'm going to be a little bit behind, but I'll catch up. Like, I yeah. mean, that's that simple, but it's one of those things, you know, oftentimes it's a disabled individual, like those thoughts go through your head of like, Oh my God, I'm holding everybody up or I'm making them wait forever because I had to go this different route. But it's like, what choice do I have? I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a big scene by hoisting my chair up and walking up the stairs. Just probably is slower than an elevator. Like it's, you know, it's just, it's just the fact of life is that, we're all uniquely ourselves, but we all share an embodied characteristic that 
success is just an internal ability to believe that you're capable of something that you may not see right now. Yeah. Completely, completely great. And most yeah. of the people like understand that like, okay, he's taking the elevator. It's going to be a little bit slower or whatever, you know, at least yeah. he'll, he'll, he's going to come up there anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So has, has CrossFit ever like reached out to you about like, you know, being an adaptive athlete and how, you know, you or like your two cents can make, make the adaptive athletes like, you know, events better. Um, not CrossFit specifically, I wouldn't say so. Um, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to be around some people that have had a lot of involvement in CrossFit. Um, and Kevin that I mentioned earlier, Kevin Ogar himself, um, he works directly through CrossFit. So he is a part of the organization. He is somebody that actually goes around and he's a, a seminar staff member. So he's, an, he goes and certifies people to get their he coaches coaches on how to get their certification. So he gets you your L1 certification, your level two certification, um, and even higher. So um, Kevin actually had an accident back in 2007, um, a ricochet barbell accident. So he over snatched and as if bar fell behind him, he fell backwards. And as the bar came up, it collapsed on him and severed his spine. And so he's I paralyzed ways down. Was that like a, like a viral video that popped up like a while back? It probably was. Yeah. Was, I mean, was, was he wearing like, I don't know. I mean, I, the one I saw, he was like wearing a blue shirt or something like that. And probably. He like, and he yeah, I think backwards. so. So, yeah. Yep. So that's, that's Kevin. Yeah. And so Kevin, Kevin was at that time, he was even like a high regionals ready to make the games athlete, you know, incredibly strong, still is incredibly strong, but yeah, it totally flipped his life upside down, but he had been known in the CrossFit world for a very long time and CrossFit was very quick to help him in his recovery and in his process. And, um, in the end, he knew he wanted to give back. And so he got involved in the, in the seminar side of CrossFit. And then they really used him as a resource as far as getting the adaptive world incorporated. And so along with him and then Chris Stoutenberg, who is a uh, Canadian wheelchair basketball, former Canadian wheelchair basketball player, uh, Paralympic Games MVP, four, I think three-time, four-time gold medalist. Um, they together have been working tirelessly to help CrossFit be more inclusive to every you know, ability out there. Um, so Chris himself started the wheel wad organization, which is the adaptive, um, wheel wad, like, or the CrossFit games and everything across that you see. Um, and so, you know, those two guys alone have really spearheaded everything. I've been fortunate enough to have some conversations with some people, but, um, you know, I think my civic duty is more just continuing to promote that it's out there, that's available, showing my abilities out there and just, you know, being a, a another example of, what CrossFit can embody for every, anybody really. Yeah. So yeah. would you, would you consider yourself the goat for what you're an athletes for the CrossFit games? <laughs> you can't ask me to toot my own horn like that. That's so aggressive. Uh, I will say this. I'm very, uh, I'm very humbled to have had the success that I've had and it's, uh, been pretty fun to dominate as I've dominated. So, <laughs> and, and, and it's even pretty cool from like four years ago to see the adaptive side of CrossFit actually grow even bigger. Absolutely. Yeah, no, entirely. And I think even within the seated world, just to see the number of guys coming out from different realms. And, and you know, I came from a Paralympic swing background, but we have, I've seen at least three or four guys that have come from Paralympic sled hockey. Um, we have guys that are competing in parallel power lifting, right. Or weightlifting right now. So, I mean, there are some serious athletes that are finding CrossFit as a, maybe as a training device for their other sports, but then soon learning that like they have potential, you know, as a CrossFit athlete. So, um, yeah, it's been really cool to see it develop as it has. And, you know, when I first went to my games experience in 2018, it, it was cool because I never experienced it before, but then you've got adaptive athletes now competing in Madison on a, mm -hmm. on a yearly basis. And I know not everybody's excited about it and I'm personally not myself either, but you know, they've gotten all eight disability classes of adaptive athletes, you know, involved in CrossFit in some fashion. We were hoping that more of us would have been involved in Madison next year at the actual physical games, but they did incorporate us in a, uh, a semifinal this year. So post open, there's more than there was last year and just being in Paralympic swimming for so long and, um, being in a like very sport, like, or a, um, disability specific sport where you had to be a certain disability and have a certain, you know, modality in the water, like CrossFit is so cool because 
it doesn't play to just one person or one mm -hmm. specific kind of person, you know, it's open to anybody and everybody. And it's literally for anybody in the world. And to see them embody that adaptive side as quickly and progressively as they have, like, I know not everybody's happy about it, but like being on the other side and seeing how slowly it hasn't happened in Paralympics and like how like long it's taken for us to get us recognition on the Paralympic side of just the actual games. Like it's amazing to see how fast CrossFit is starting to embody adaptive athletes. Like that's out of this world. So yeah, I could be, I could be bitter about it, but I know there's bigger and better things yet to come. So it's just, you know, keep doing our, keep doing our job until then. Yeah, pretty much. You got, you got a couple more years to like, you know, just be the champ again. And then <laughs> that's right. That's right. I don't know. These old bones are getting old. That's all I'm saying. Dude, I, I, I don't there. want to hear that. I'm, 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 I'm 22, man. So I don't want to hear that. <laughs> very cool so we're, we're getting close to the end so um sure. are you are you planning to do waterpalooza this year at all or yeah yep i'm heading down next month yeah looking forward to it so right, awesome. almost exactly a month out very cool so um what are your uh, obviously it's gonna be 2022 in a couple of weeks but like what yep. are your main goals in you know 2022 good question um as you've kind of mentioned a little bit already i i mean i love the coaching side of it i really enjoy that um and I would really love to get myself more involved in, with the Adaptive Training Academy. So they are, they are like Kevin and Stoudy and Alex Zirkenbach, who basically started that CrossFit certification for adaptive or ad, F, adaptive training for CrossFit. And they have since away since then like kind of broken away and become their own sanctioned ATA, as they call it, Adaptive Training Academy. And so they they travel as any L1 staff member does, you know, going going somewhere across the country for a, for a weekend, once a month like that, and just providing trainings about how to be a coach for adaptive athletes. And that would be something I'd love to be a part of and just get involved with that. That'd be so cool. Um, again, just another opportunity for me to kind of embody multiple passions at once and, and really enjoy and, and share that passion with other people. Um, I really look forward to, you know, the competitive side of CrossFit yet, you know, I'm, I'm excited and eager about the opportunities that, CrossFit is providing adaptive athletes and having the semifinal. Um, so, you know, we'll take that on full head on and, um, you know, keep training hard for that. And then um, really just a lot of personal work goals of continuing to grow the swim club and continue to grow our gym and make sure we're, a, 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 you know, a space that's welcoming to anybody and everybody and hopefully get a few more adaptive athletes. I'm actually kind of premature to 2021, uh, 2022. I'm actually taking my first, uh, disabled athlete to his first Paralympic swim meet this weekend. So oh, like, cool. yeah. So over in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I'm really excited about that just because it's, uh, it's another, again, full circle moment where it's like the swimmer turned coach and I'll probably see a whole bunch of all my old coaches on deck. And now I get to share the stopwatch instead of getting yelled at. So it's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Very, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So do you, do you have like a favorite book that you like to read like over and over again? Oh, I hate to be that guy. I'm not a huge reader. I can't okay. lie. Um, I've read a few books. Um, one that was swimming related, but felt very relatable in many different ways. And probably to most people it's called gold in the water. Um, it's actually about a, a team of four different athletes that were all vying for Olympic spots back in the eighties. Um, and it's very interesting to just see the difference in personalities between the four athletes and how they all somehow kind of like click together. And it ironically had a lot of the same successes and failures that they showed and, and described in the, in the true story book. So uh, I just found that really motivating in a lot of ways. Um, that was always a great one. Um, I was a huge fan of Ben Bergeron's chasing excellence book. Uh, I yeah. thought it was a really, really great read for anybody that's just looking for some motivation in life. I mean, you're going to find, every page is a quote you can pull out and put on a wall and remember the rest of your life. So it's just all, it's a lot in that regard, but I thought it was just really cool because I think a lot of what I read is what I try to embody as a coach or as a, as a person on a daily basis. So that's always kind of fun, but yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a huge reader, but I definitely do enjoy, I make sure I enjoy what I'm reading when I read. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. So uh, what's, what's in your gym bag? Oh, my gym bag. Okay. Well, um, plenty of products from Equip Products. I have to shout out to them because they are the number one manufacturer for all adaptive needs. So they create the lap mat. So when I'm lifting and pulling things like a heavy barbell off my lap, it's a nice sponge and um, 
solid surface that just, you know, covers your laps, protects your femurs and all that good stuff from a barbell. Um, there's always a little canister of C4 if I already need that little pickup, you know? So <laughs> just, uh, I, I won't even begin to admit how much dry C4 shots I took at the games just to make sure I was ready for each event, <laughs> but that happened. Um, the good old lacrosse ball, got to make sure you're mobile and ready to go. Um, I don't know. Usually not a lot. I, it's, uh, it's, it's and the, and the fifth wheel, of course, got to have the fifth wheel, make sure you're ready to lift, but yep. Usually it's just get to the gym, pull up the weights and let's just start cranking. <laughs> very, cool, very cool. So, um, what would you tell somebody that's trying to get into CrossFit or the CrossFit games with, with, with CP? Advocate for yourself. The biggest thing that it always comes down to being successful or not is having the right support system, but they're never going to know if you're not willing to be open about how you feel about things, about what you're capable of doing, what you're not capable of doing, um, and where you feel limits. You know, I think that was the reason that Steven Hours was so successful in the beginning of the swimming was that we were trying to do things that were more successful for me and they were not traditional swimming skills. You know, that I had to do things for flip turns and diving up the block a lot differently than most. But, you know, as we got further and further in our career, I was more and more comfortable saying like, nah, dude, that didn't work out. Like, that's just not going to help me. I don't feel comfortable doing that and those kind of things. And anybody with CP, I can assure them or anybody with a discipline in general that there is somebody in your community at a gym, at a fitness center, that's just willing to help you. Like they are there, they are eager to work with you and excited to be a part of your life. As long as you're ready to, ready to be open to them. If you give them the resources they need, that's when success happens. Very cool. Love it. So let's just say, you know, everything's said and done in your life. How do you want people to know you as? Oh man. Um, Throwing some bangers out there. Yeah. Geez. Hit me there. Um, I don't, I think it just, I, I would want to be that person that always saw positive in situations, you know, and it's even when you say like, you know, when you and your client failed with a 30 pound bag, it was one of those moments where I'd see that and I say like, okay, that's not a failure. We just saw that we got rid of a solution. That's not going to work. For, like not going to be the answer. We're one solution closer to finding the real answer. Like, yes. I feel like I've always been pretty optimistic and enthusiastic with life about that kind of thing. And um, I've been patient and persistent. And I think it's always paid off to help me see that there's always going to be a reason that things happen. And there's a reason that we are where we are in life. And it's only a stepping stone moving forward. So I think just always kind of knowing that I can be a positive light in somebody's life is really all I need, because I'm just so grateful knowing that I am where I am because of the people that allowed me to believe I could be there. Mm -hmm. So as long as I can be that somebody for somebody else, I'll definitely die a happy man. Very cool. Very cool. So uh, where can people reach out to you if they have any questions about like, you know, training with CP or anything else with like adaptive athletes? Yeah, sure. Well, personally, you can find me on any Instagram or Facebook, uh, just my name, Tom, and then Miazga, M-I-A-Z-G-A. So uh, just find my handle there send me a DM. I'm usually pretty good about getting back to those. Um, but definitely check out wheel, the wheelwad website, check out wheelwad.com, see everything that they are involved with, see all the different competitions and different events. Um, they have a great gym finder, uh, registry as well, where they can help pinpoint gyms in your area that have adaptive certified trainers, uh, along with the ATA program. So the adaptive training Academy has the same thing. Um, they offer, like I said, monthly seminars all over the country. So check out their website, check out their dates, Go and see what they can do uh, to help kind of, you know, just give you some more resources to get started or be that person for somebody. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for, you know, taking the time, especially like off of coaching and stuff. So just <laughs> come and talk to me. I know you're a busy guy and I, I really do appreciate, you know, learning more about CP, your experience as a CrossFit Games athlete and like, you know, what your plans are for the future. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tom. I really enjoyed it. All right. Have a good one. Thank you too.